Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good to see all y'all. Hello out there in video land. Wish you were here. Tonight, yeah, I'd like to speak about doing the right things, but for the wrong reasons. And this line of thought began back in August when I was doing my daily Bible reading in Acts 8. This is after the stoning And the persecution of the church had begun. And always before, when I was reading chapter 8 in Acts, my focus had been on the actions of Philip and Peter and John. But this time around, my attention was drawn to the details of Simon the sorcerer, who did do some right things, but for the wrong reasons. So when volunteers were requested to speak, I thought, well, I've got 30 minutes, so uh, I need to maybe expand on this some. And I uh, immediately thought of Balaam and the, his oracles in the Old Testament. And I also thought of Judas Iscariot. It didn't take long before I realized I'd bitten off more than I could chew. And uh, so I set Balaam aside and focused on Simon, my original idea, and Judas. But then after looking at a lot of details and spending a lot of time with Judas, I even had to set Simon the Sorcerer aside. So maybe if we come up to parts two and three, if it ever comes up in the future, I can cover those. But tonight I am going to speak to you about Judas Iscariot. We know that he is one of the original 12 apostles, as recorded in the three synoptic gospels. We know that he is one of the original 12 that were sent out to proclaim that gospel with Christ given authority to heal, heal the sick and drive out demons. That comes from Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 3, and Luke chapter 9. We know that he was a steward in charge of finances, a very necessary endeavor even in today's church. In John 12, verse 6, it states that Judas was the keeper of the money bag. Unfortunately, we also know that by this time he was stealing from those very funds. In John chapter 13, verse 29, during the Last Supper, Jesus had made statements which confused those who were in his presence and mystified them, but was in reality Jesus' recognition and acknowledgement of his betrayer. It's written, Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. So it showed that Judas was doing the right things. He preached the gospel. He was granted God-given power to heal. And he provided for the needs of Jesus, the apostles, and the poor in general. But he was doing it for all the wrong reasons. And I asked myself, how? Well, lust for money is an easy enough conclusion. It also applies to Balaam and his oracles. It also applies to Simon the sorcerer. One commentary suggests that Judas may have been in fear for his life. If so, the irony is truly inescapable. Other commentators have considered this, that Judas betrayed Jesus in an attempt to ingratiate himself with the Jewish leader, to get on the good side of what he considered to be the winners, since by this point he considered Jesus' cause to be a lost one. Another thought that was contemplated was that Judas was angry at Jesus because he was not the Messiah expected by the Jews. We know that they expected their messianic leader would elevate their nation to be the greatest in the world. In any event, did it all start out this way? Well, I was shown Psalm 41, verse 9, a psalm of David. It says, Even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. This verse is quoted by Jesus in John chapter 13, Verse 18, again at the Last Supper, shortly after Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples in humility. 
Jesus foresees his betrayal. It was prophesied. It was known before creation. Did it have to be Judas? No. It was his choice, his motives, his desires. This also is recognized by God before creation. Jesus' betrayal and sacrifice were necessary. But it was Judas who was going to make the wrong choices. Do I believe Judas was born to be bad? I don't believe in such a thing. Satan definitely had a hand in this. John chapter 13, verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. The Greek literal puts it this way. The devil now having put into the heart that should betray him. So Judas is being tempted, but he could still refuse. But now we see the true motive that's driving him, and it comes from the heart. Into the heart that should betray him. John chapter 13, verse 27. I want to look at two parts in this one verse. The first part, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Before he was tempted, the Greek literal says, and after the morsel, then entered into that one, Satan. He was tempted before, but now he has chosen to serve the evil one with his heart, mind, and soul. The second part of that verse 27 in John 13. What you were about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. And I am struck by that question as I have been before. Who is Jesus truly speaking to? We know that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, Peter dared to rebuke Jesus when he was speaking of his impending death. And it's written, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. I believe that just as Jesus recognizes the true motives, he recognizes the true source, the true face of evil. Judas is a vessel, but Satan is the source. I'm going to read now from John chapter 6, verses 64 through 71. Fairly long passage here. It's the end of a statement that Jesus makes when many disciples had deserted him because of his teachings. Starting in verse 64, Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. <clears throat> then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Here we have it. Judas goes from being a child of God to being influenced, prompted by the devil, to becoming a puppet of Satan. John chapter 17, verse 12. While praying for his disciples, Jesus says, While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Scripture would be fulfilled. I read the prophecy that was written in Psalm chapter 41. Now I want to read from Psalm chapter 55, verses 12 through 14. Again, a Psalm of David. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. 
but it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. It's important to notice that in both Psalm 41 and Psalm 55, the prophecy involves one who is a friend. Jesus and Judas were friends. Matthew chapter 26, verse 24. This is Matthew's record of the Last Supper. While speaking of his friend, Jesus says, The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. That's an interesting word, woe. It comes from the Greek word oi, which comes from the Hebrew word hoy, H-O-Y, or oi, like oi ve. We've all heard that in every Hollywood movie and TV show ever representing a Jewish character. In Matthew 24, verse 19, Jesus speaks of the coming of the Son of Man at the end of times. The King James and the Greek literal use woe regarding the ones who will suffer at that time. But the NIV uses how dreadful. And the ESV uses alas. This is the same usage by Jesus when speaking of Judas, his betrayer. It is an expression of sympathy, of pity, of compassion, acute sorrow, sorrow for the loss of a friend. Now we come to that fateful day when Jesus was crucified and what was Judas doing? Matthew's the only one of the four Gospels to look at this. In Matthew 27, verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and return the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and elders. Judas saw it. He was there. And the priests were condemning Jesus before Pilate. Just like Peter, when he made eye-to-eye -eye contact with Jesus, when he was denying him. He was in that presence. As I just read in the NIV, it says that Judas was seized with remorse. The ESV interprets that Judas changed his mind. The King James and Greek literal state that Judas repented. This is not true repentance. There are two Greek words that are used in repentance that are shown here. In Acts, one in Acts 2.38, we all know, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's one Greek usage of repentance. The Greek literal regarding Judas is a different Greek word. Both involve feelings of remorse and deep regret and guilt. But for Judas, it did not lead to a conversion of the spirit or a change in his action. Judas is now truly the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Now comes the tough part. I know what G Judas did, the right things, but for the wrong reasons. Now I have to consider the right things, the wrong reasons in me. And I can't speak for anyone else because I don't know what's in the heart of men. But God confronts me daily and I praise Him for that, for what's in my heart. I read in John chapter 6, verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? We have here the process of elimination. Sherlock Holmes says, I know he's a fictional character, but Arthur Conan Doyle has Sherlock Holmes say this, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Spent years from my late teens to my mid-forties searching through all impossibilities until I was left facing that truth. I never doubted the truth of the existence of God and Christ Jesus, but I was trying to modify it and reconstruct it to fit my own narrative, my desires, my motives of the heart. So when I first started reading the Bible again in my forties and I read what Peter had said here, my soul rejoiced. 
because I knew that I had truly eliminated any and all alternatives. There is no one else to go to. So I have to test myself and ask myself, am I doing the right things? And if so, is it for the wrong reasons? Is it for money? Yeah, right. That's a joke. Uh, you can look at my financial situation, and if I'm in it for the money, man, I blew it. Besides, we know what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Is it for status or recognition, confirmation of my human value, relevance to society? I can confidently reject that wrong reason. I'm not even comfortable in public. To quote another man, I don't do well in social situations. I make a better impression when I'm not around. One of the countless reasons I cherish my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, comes from John. And these are countless reasons, but this is one of them. John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Jesus is in Jerusalem doing miraculous signs and receiving great acknowledgement from the population there. Verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Is it to save my life that I'm doing these things? Well, hardly. I've heard Mike say it, and I agree. I don't fear death. I do fear pain. I've broken some bones, and yeah, I'm scared, kid. Some might even say I treat the possibility of death a little too casually or carelessly or frivolously, pick an adjective. But I don't deceive myself either. My self-preservation instincts have kicked in quite often in a flash before my mind can even kick into gear particularly ducking and dodging traffic in these last few years, which are the most frequent moments of my near-death experiences. But I do identify with Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And I don't mean y'all. I know y'all do just fine without me. But I am devastated with fear and concern for my family members whom I have failed miserably. Even at that, I wonder if my passing would cause their complete despair and downfall or if it might even be the catalyst for their salvation. And I pray to God that it be the second if that ever happens. So no, it's not to save my life. Is it to save my soul? Absolutely. I do not want to spend eternity damned. I hope I'm not too coarse in saying this, but it is, I think, a proper application of the phrase that literally scares the hell out of me. Is it to further a worldly agenda? I spoke of Judas possibly being angry with Jesus because he felt that Jesus wasn't promoting the Jewish expectations of the Messiah. Their expectations would, by its very nature, place Israel in a position of preeminence in the nations of the world. Their expectations failed miserably, missed the whole concept. I believe to deny this fact is to ignore the entire history of the Old Testament, and by fulfillment and proclamation, the New Testament. I cannot, I will not, I must not attempt to make equal our place on the same foundation. Any national identity of men's nations, men's kingdoms, if you will, with the kingdom of God. I cannot, I must not, I will not attempt to equate our place on the same foundation, any political dogma, any political belief, any political word with the holy gospel of the living word, which is Christ Jesus. So I'm left with all my reasons are the right ones. I want to serve the Lord because I love him with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength because he first loves me.
even as I struggle and sin to this very day. I want to glorify and give all praise and honor and credit to God Almighty because He has chosen to withhold His justly deserved wrath on me by His grace and mercy in the birth, the life, the teaching, the sacrificial death, and the resurrection of Christ my Lord. I want to share with everyone this comfort, this joy, this peace, this hope that sustains me. I want to proclaim it, to make it obvious, undeniable in every aspect of my life, to publicly acknowledge that any good I may do is God and His Spirit abiding in me, not my human nature or so-called human morality. I'm not very good at it, but I'm trying to do better. I need God. I need Christ. I need the Holy Spirit. I cannot endure this world without them. I have no purpose without them. I am of no use without them. I want to be with God in heaven eternally. Are these the right reasons? Well, I'll close with this thought from Paul in Philippians 1 verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice.